Section 15 of A Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. A Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy by Lawrence Stern. Section 15 The Captive, Paris. The bird in his cage pursued me into my room. I sat down close to my table, and leaning my head upon my hand, I began to figure to myself the miseries of confinement. I was in a right frame for it, and so I gave full scope to my imagination. I was going to begin with the millions of my fellow-creatures, born to no inheritance but slavery. But finding, however affecting the picture was, that I could not bring it near me, and that the multitude of sad groups in it did but distract me, I took a single captive, and having first shut him up in his dungeon, I then looked through the twilight of his grated door to take his picture. I beheld his body half wasted away with long expectation and confinement, and felt what kind of sickness of the heart it was which arises from hope deferred. Upon looking nearer I saw him pale and feverish. In thirty years the western breeze had not once fanned his blood. He had seen no sun, no moon in all that time, nor had the voice of friend or kinsman breathed through his lattice. His children! But here my heart began to bleed and I was forced to go on with another part of the portrait. He was sitting upon the ground upon a little straw in the furthest corner of his dungeon, which was alternately his chair and bed. A little calendar of small sticks were laid at the head, notched all over with the dismal days and nights he had passed there. He had one of these little sticks in his hand, and with a rusty nail he was etching another day of misery to add to the heap. As I darkened the little light he had, he lifted up a hopeless eye towards the door, then cast it down, shook his head, and went on with his work of affliction. I heard his chains upon his legs, as he turned his body to lay his little stick upon the bundle. He gave a deep sigh. I saw the iron enter his soul. I burst into tears. I could not sustain the picture of confinement which my fancy had drawn. I started up from my chair, and calling La Fleur, I bid him bespeak me a remise, and have it ready at the door of the hotel by nine in the morning. I'll go directly, said I, myself, to Monsieur le Duc de Choiseux. La Fleur would have put me to bed, but not willing he should see anything upon my cheek that would cost the honest fellow a heartache. I told him I would go to bed by myself, and bid him go do the same. The Starling Road to Versailles I got into my remise the hour I proposed. La Fleur got up behind, and I bid the coachman make the best of his way to Versailles. As there was nothing in this road, or rather nothing which I look for in travelling, I cannot fill up the blank better than with a short history of this self-same bird, which became the subject of the last chapter. 
whilst the honourable mr was waiting for a wind at dover it had been caught upon the cliffs before it could well fly by an english lad who was his groom who not caring to destroy it had taken it in his breast into the packet and by course of feeding it and taking it once under his protection in a day or two he grew fond of it and got it safe along with him to paris at paris the lad had laid out a livre in a little cage for the starling and as he had little to do better the five months his master stayed there he taught it in his mother's tongue the four simple words and no more to which i owned myself so much its debtor upon his master's going on for italy the lad had given it to the master of the hotel but his little song for liberty being in an unknown language at paris the bird had little or no store set by him so la fleur bought both him and his cage for me for a bottle of burgundy in my return from italy i brought him with me to the country in whose language he had learned his notes and telling the story of him to lord a lord a begged the bird of me in a week lord a gave him to lord b lord b made a present of him to lord c and lord c's gentleman sold him to lord d's for a shilling lord d gave him to lord e and so on half round the alphabet from that rank he passed into the lower house and passed the hands of as many commoners but as all these wanted to get in and my bird wanted to get out he had almost as little store set by him in london as in paris it is impossible but many of my readers must have heard of him and if any by mere chance have ever seen him i beg leave to inform them that that bird was my bird or some vile copy set up to represent him i have nothing farther to add upon him but that from that time to this i have borne this poor starling as the crest to my arms thus and let the herald's officers twist his neck about if they dare the address versailles i should not like to have my enemy take a view of my mind when i am going to ask protection of any man for which reason i generally endeavour to protect myself but this going to monsieur le duc de c was an act of compulsion had it been an act of choice i should have done it i suppose like other people how many mean plans of dirty address as i went along did my servile heart form i deserved the bastille for every one of them then nothing would serve me when i got within sight of versailles but putting words and sentences together and conceiving attitudes and tones to wreathe myself into monsieur le duc de c's good graces this will do said i just as well retorted i again as a coat carried up to him by an adventurous tailor without taking his measure fool continued i see monsieur le duc's face first observe what character is written in it take notice in what posture he stands to hear you mark the turns and expressions of his body and limbs and for the tone the first sound which comes from his lips will give it you 
and from all these together you'll compound an address at once upon the spot which cannot disgust the duke the ingredients are his own and most likely to go down well said i i wish it well over coward again as if man to man was not equal throughout the whole surface of the globe and if in the field why not face to face in the cabinet too and trust me yorick whenever it is not so man is false to himself and betrays his own succours ten times where nature does it once go to the duc de c with the bastille in thy looks my life for it thou wilt be sent back to paris in half an hour with an escort i believe so said i then i'll go to the duke by heaven with all the gaiety and debonairness in the world and there you are wrong again replied i a heart at ease yorick flies into no extremes tis ever on its centre well well cried i as the coachman turned in at the gates i find i shall do very well and by the time he had wheeled round the court and brought me up to the door i found myself so much the better for my own lecture that i neither ascended the steps like a victim to justice who was to part with life upon the topmost nor did i mount them with a skip and a couple of strides as i do when i fly up eliza to thee to meet it as i entered the door of the saloon i was met by a person who possibly might be the maitre d'hotel but had more the air of one of the under secretaries who told me the duc de c was busy i am utterly ignorant said i of the forms of obtaining an audience being an absolute stranger and what is worse in the present conjuncture of affairs being an englishman too he replied that did not increase the difficulty i made him a slight bow and told him i had something of importance to say to monsieur le duc the secretary looked towards the stairs as if he was about to leave me to carry up this account to some one but i must not mislead you said i for what i have to say is of no manner of importance to monsieur le duc de c but of great importance to myself c'est une autre affaire replied he not at all said i to a man of gallantry but pray good sir continued i when can a stranger hope to have access in not less than two hours said he looking at his watch the number of equipage in the courtyard seemed to justify the calculation that i could have no nearer a prospect and as walking backwards and forwards in the saloon without a soul to commune with was for the time as bad as being in the bastille itself i instantly went back to my remise and bid the coachman drive me to the cordon bleu which was the nearest hotel i think there is a fatality in it i seldom go to the place i set out for end of section 15 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey